to Online for Authors, where I, Terry M. Brown, author of character-driven fiction and host of the podcast, introduce readers to characters they'd love to invite to lunch by interviewing authors, discussing their books, learning about the writing process, and even, on occasion, chatting live with a panel of authors to discuss topics relevant to both readers and writers. My guest today on the Online for Authors podcast is Katherine Dodson, author of the book Portrait of Deception. Catherine writes about women who have to become their own heroes, whether they're solving a crime or figuring out the next phase of their lives. In my book review, I stated Portrait of Deception is a wonderful suspense novel that will keep you on the edge of your seat. Margot, a photographer on her way to fame, soon finds herself entrenched in a madman's attempt to take over first his country and then those countries around him. Although she's hired to take his photos, she soon learns that his plan includes owning her. Unless she can escape, she'll never leave the grounds, at least not alive. Unfortunately, Margot is not completely innocent. Can she figure out how to get free, save her family and friends, find a new path forward? This is a gritty story that will keep you on the edge of your seat, but it is also character-driven enough that you will cheer Margot as she learns lessons about herself and her past and makes decisions for a better future. Today on Online for Authors, I am chatting with Katherine Dodson, author of Portrait of Deception. Welcome, Katherine. Thanks for having me. I am so excited to have you. I read the book. I loved the book. But before we really get into it, let's tell the readers what they can expect when they open up the cover and, and get jump into this book. What are they going to get? So this book really is a thriller. It's about a young woman who just finds herself in an impossible and dangerous situation um, and has to escape. So yes, and have I, you on the edge of your seat. And it did. It definitely. And I'm not, I don't like stories that, that like terrify me to the mm -hmm. point that I can't sleep at night. So this wasn't that. But it was an edge of the seat, like what's going to happen next? Is she going to get out of it? Like it was it was just the right amount of, of grip for me that didn't leave me with terrible nightmares, which I have if I re read something entirely too scary. Um, but but enough that it made me, you know, like, ooh, what's going to happen, right? So why... What is it about this thriller genre? Why do you like writing in thriller versus like any other genre out there? So I actually write across several genres. Okay. And You're like me. <laughs> so I have some women's fiction novels and uh -huh. some mysteries. Um, and this one actually was supposed to start out as it had a different title and everything. And it was supposed to be more of a women's fiction novel. And I am a plotter and I had the whole thing plotted out. And this novel just took a turn in a different direction, um, which was really fun. Uh, and right. made up this country um, and this dictator and he it just became more evil. But it's not horror. I can't write horror. Right. I can't read horror. Me neither. Um, just... But this novel had a life of its own. It knew what it wanted to be. Isn't that great? So that's interesting because you say you're a plotter. I'm a pantser all the way. Mm -hmm. And I have had the experience of trying to plot because I felt that, that that's what I needed to do in order to be an actual author that I, I must plot. And I tried and my characters refuse. They just <laughs> simply refuse to go along with it. And they're like, we have the better story. So if you'll just let us tell it. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that it's interesting that even though you consider yourself a plotter all the way, that you found yourself plotting and then having to throw away the whole thing because it just wasn't going where you intended it to go. It, you know, my characters usually take the reins at some point yeah. and will do, do they? things that surprise me. Um, and I don't, I don't have like an 18 pages long plot, but I definitely, you know, plot out the story. But this is the first one that's just like, no, we don't want to be that book. You know, we Isn't want to have more fun and be more exciting and darker so, and grittier. So and then my, my question to you is, is 
as an author who likes to plot, did you fight that at all? Did you did you try to insist it go back into your little into your into your little you know line, or did you just say woohoo, we're going for the ride? So I, I, when I plot, I lay it out at the beginning. I have this like you know process I go through, but after that, I really do. I look at where I'm supposed to be, and then I just write. Okay. And so if it if it starts going off the rails, I follow it because it's a lot of fun. Yeah, it is. It is. So you sound to me like what you are is more of an in between, like like you have a, a plot. <laughs> yeah, planstered. I mean, they they call them that. I think that maybe that's where you are is because I've talked with plotters who have a real problem with when their characters go off the rails like mm -hmm. like it it they find it very disconcerting and you didn't both times you talked about it your face lit up like wasn't that fun yeah. and i i don't know that that a a plotter 100 would find that to be fun i mean what is fun about some character coming in and wrecking everything that you've done up until <laughs> this point right <laughs> so yeah, that's as it. long as I'm in the zone writing and having fun, right. whether it's following the script or not, it doesn't really matter to me. That's that's wonderful. Um, so I'm curious, Margot. Well, in fact, this is the part that maybe shows that it was going to be a women's fiction to begin with, because Margot she gets into trouble early on, right? Mm -hmm. She's she's gone to this party and she's going to be honored and she's a little full of herself at the moment and she's made it. And then she does something stupid and she's with people that she doesn't know very well. And someone slips something into her drink. And my thought was, is it's almost a cautionary tale for, for young women who are out doing and being out there to like pay attention to your surroundings Right. Because she right. ended she ended up drugged. And I'm not really giving anything away because this all happens in the very, very, very beginning of the story. But she ends up like drugged and and the next thing you know, her world has changed. Right. So that's really interesting because that's something that's the same in all my books, no matter what genre okay. I write in, is that I have characters that have goals and flaws that are standing right. in the way of them getting where they want to go. And so they really have to learn to become their own heroes and become smarter and have this big character arc. Because if not, that's just not an exciting book for me. So the genre right. doesn't really matter as much as this kind of theme of, you know, they have to become their own heroes and save themselves and, you know, figure it all out. Figure it out. Right. Well, and you did that with her. I felt like, like she was a character that sometimes you wanted to shake and say, come on, get with the program. What's your problem? Mm -hmm. And, you know, don't you understand it was your ego that got you here in the first place? What are you doing? <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. And, and the, why do you keep going it alone? Why do you keep going it alone? You know, that kind of, of idea. And then, but in the end, she did kind of, figure herself out mm -hmm. and figure out like what's important and what she needs and those kinds of things. So I enjoyed that. Um, the premise is really original. Like, you know, it's a photographer and, you know, you, you start out and it's like, well, what is this, what is this going to be about? She's a photographer. And the next thing you know, you've got this evil oligarch, right. Who mm -hmm. wants to be preserved in history as something else. And he mm -hmm. wants it, he wants it in a photo and he wants it in a way that how can you argue when you see it in photos, right? And the two, the two meet and then everything, you know, essentially all hell breaks loose from that point. Where did you come up with this concept of, of a photographer and an evil oligarch that, like, <laughs> um, well, it's all about storytelling. We see so much storytelling now in pictures, right? Because we have right. social media and all of this. And you never know what to believe, what's true and what's real. Exactly. So my son happens to be a photographer. He's in college. Um, and so sometimes I could look at that world of photography through his eyes. And so when I, I tried to do that, but then also have this bit of, you know, be careful about what you look at. The media is not always real because there are people behind the scenes trying to manipulate 
their image. And that's what he very, very much wants to do. And he is determined to use her to do it for some very nefarious right. reasons. Right. Right. Um, I just, I found it, and, and I do agree with your point 100%, where, you know, like what you see on the internet or what you see on, especially like social media, you, you're getting a, a, just a glimpse in time. And it might not even be a real glimpse. It could be right. all set up, you know, for all you know, the woman with the smiling baby you know, was smacking her 30 seconds ago. And now we've put this beautiful thing behind us and, you know, and, and it's not, it's not real. Um, hey, it's 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 not labeled fiction like books are. Yes, <laughs> yes. And so it's hard to know. Like like it used to be, or you felt like if you saw it in a photo, it was real. Mm -hmm. And Absolutely. now, now not necessarily for that reason because it can be set up. But then throw in AI on top of that. Oh yeah. Right. Right. And and you don't even know. Like they can I put. Agree. a they can put a face onto a portrait that was made by for someone else. And all of a sudden you're in it. And wow. It's, it's kind of crazy. So this, this idea isn't that far fetched. The idea that someone would want someone to come in and create them to be, right. you know, different. Right. I think it's right? done all the time. I mean, in this case, it's a really bad guy who wants to, right. you know, basically, rule the world in, in, right. in an ancient like Tsarist type faction fashion and so he he wants to manipulate everything so yeah no I just that that was really great um I don't want to give away so we're not going to give away the ending but you don't necessarily wrap everything up with unicorns and rainbows you know no. like like a lot of books end up with the happily ever after and everyone walks off into the sunset smiling right and this it's not that the story doesn't wrap up it doesn't leave you hanging in an ugly way where you don't feel like you don't feel like it was satisfactory but it isn't necessarily all all pretty with a big bow on the top right. why do you do your endings that way because life isn't like that right I mean, in real life, if you've gone through, you know, a super traumatic event and you don't know who to trust and you've had to get yourself out of some really rough situations and you've put other people in danger, you're not just going to be like, okay, everything's great now. <laughs> I mean, that's just not how it is. And I, I, my characters are very real to me. Um, right. You know, when I write them, I mean, I am in their heads and I hope that when people read them, it's the same way. So if I were to, you know, it, the story is completely wrapped up at the end, but if I were to make it just like, and they lived happily ever after, it's just fake to me. It's right. It's not how real people go through life. Well, and, and in some ways, when she starts the, when we start with her, she is kind of a happily ever after wrap it up in a bow place that's what yes. she thinks right mm -hmm. and now my world will be perfect and then she lives through some some massive trauma and you do you come out of trauma on the other side and it's not that you no longer believe that things can be happy but you no longer believe in the fairy tale ending and fairy tale is the perfect there's a theme of fairy tale throughout the whole right. book because she goes you know to this country and lives in a castle, castle and, and right and, and it sounds like a fairy tale and well and she even meets a handsome man right mm -hmm. i mean we have a little romance going on in there and and the whole thing except that it's not it's not what it seems right none of it right. is what it seems right. right and so if you came out of that and everything was just fine um you know my the women i write are not disney princesses Right. right. They are real people and it's a little bit gritty and they are not going to come out and just say, OK, everything's great now. Oh, <laughs> yeah. So Margot, is mm -hmm. she someone, you know, like is she was she based on anyone, you know, or is she like more of a conglomerate of people, you know, she's more of a conglomerate of people I know in my head. She's this, she looks like this very pretty girl I went to high school with, just with the blonde. And, um, but in terms of her personality, she's a bunch of different people, but she's um, one of those people who's just very 
like dedicated to her art and knows where she wants to go and thinks she has it all figured out. And we've probably all been there at points right. in our life. And then the world just shows you, you don't know what's going on. Right. right. And then the world intervenes and says, yeah. okay, you think you have that all wrapped up. Huh? Exactly. <laughs> let, me, let me show you, let me show you a little bit of life. Yeah. Yep. Um, are you at, in Margo at all? Oh, I'm sure that I am that kind of drive and, uh, you know, blinders on sometimes. Uh, but I'm older than Margo, so I'm a little smarter than Margo. So, so you're, you're early Margo. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe once upon a time. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so, but definitely that, that just kind of drive to, to get where you want to go is part of me. Right. Right. So I'm a little curious because you did bring up that you don't write in just one genre. Mm -hmm. What genre was your first book in? What did you do? So my first published book was a mystery. Okay. So, but, but very much again, a, a, a woman who, you know, had faults, had to overcome them, had to right. her own So, hero. so, so like me, you're very character driven. It's very it's, character driven. It's more yes. about the character and then other things happen. And that's what helps you decide what else is going on in this right. book. Right. And, and in this book, Tequila Midnight, it's also got a lot of suspense, like okay. Portrait of Deception does. So they're, they're similar, but Margaret didn't really have a mystery to solve. She's got a situation she has to get right. herself Exactly. Out. Exactly. So you've done, you've done thriller or, or suspense. Mm -hmm. You've done mystery. You said women's fiction. Yep. I have two women's fiction uh, books that are published. Both of them are older characters. It's really fun to be able to write like women in their fifties who right. have been kind of kicked around by life a little bit and, you know, have them still have to figure out what's next because it ain't right. over. <laughs> well, and you know, that's the thing is I think sometimes people make the assumption that these kinds of, of things that happen to Margot happen when you're young. Mm -hmm. And once you're older, then your life just becomes, you know, more autopilot. And that's at least I'm 60 now and I have not yet found the autopilot place in my life. No, not even close. <laughs> yeah. You know, like I keep there's there's always something my my arc, my personal arc continues all the time. And so I would assume that if you're going to write characters and that's mm -hmm. what I assume when I'm writing them, that just because I have a grandmother character doesn't mean that she's doing nothing now, but sitting on the porch and knitting. I mean, right. she has life and it's still going on and she's still learning her lessons. And sometimes yeah, there are lessons that she should have learned years ago and just never did because she was good at hiding from them and didn't, didn't mm -hmm. wish to, didn't wish to face that lesson, you know? Right. Or sometimes you come to kind of a new crossroads. A new, right. In your life. Right. And something something that you weren't expecting mm -hmm. or even if you should have been expecting, you didn't recognize that it was going to touch you, you right. know, like, like a health it, issue or a, you know. Yes. And, and how much it really rocks your world and yeah. how it makes you look at your life in a different way and, and say, is this where I want to be? Is this what I right. want? Or am I going to just take off and, you know, do something new? So I know you say you're a plotter. So when you get started, you you know where you are planning to put this in a genre category. Like you say, I'm going to sit down and write a thriller, except this last one didn't follow suit very well. <laughs> yeah. So the ideas, I let the ideas kind of, you know, ferment in my mind right. until right. they're ready to come out. And then I do, one of the first things I do is, there's three things that I do is work on what is the book? What are the care? Who are the characters? And then what is the plot? And so, okay. yeah, it's first, what is the genre? What is the theme? What, you know, just that, where would it be shelved in a bookstore? Right. That right. whole type of thing. I have to start there regardless of where I end up because it, it helps me do the rest of it. Okay. Well, if I start with that type of book, you know, and, and I've already been thinking about this character, well, what is it that she's going to have to overcome to right. fit that genre and then right. go into the plot? Where do you get your story ideas? I have no idea. They just show up. Do they really? I mean, I, I'll be working. And, so, and I always think, well, if I never get another idea, I'll just quit writing. And I don't know what it is. I just It's like things suddenly connect in my brain. And I'm like, 
Oh, oh that, that would, would be fascinating. Yeah. And then yeah. I let it marinate for a while. And then it, you know, then I've got a hold of the story. And I keep thinking that it's something that could easily go away. But like, I already know what my next book's going to be. And the one after that, these ideas are just back there waiting to get out it feels like i i feel like sometimes i have a traffic jam in my head of these ideas <laughs> and i will i will go and i'll write down like the basic concept because i'm not an i'm not a plotter at all but just like this basic the thing that keeps mm -hmm. going around in my head and i write it down and then i tell myself there it's written down now hush because i am on a different book and i can't do three at once that's you know, so you've funny. got to, you've got to be quiet for a little while and let me finish what I'm writing. Right. <laughs> right. Right. Well, it's funny. I used to get kind of one idea at a time. I'd be working on a book, but I kind of know what the next one was going to be. But my mysteries are a series. They're all about the same character. And so they're kind of lining up, which is weird. But, you know, you just, right. again, it's just like, you know, you may be a plotter, but your book's going to do what it's going to do. And it's the same thing with the ideas, you know. Right. Right. I tend to get my ideas will come from the strangest places, something very small that huh. doesn't seem like much of anything. And then my mind will go to, well, what would happen if? Right. And then, bam, it's like, whoa, wouldn't that be cool? What would happen if, you know, like, how did that, you know, I had one, it was somebody told me a story that turned into a book. It was it's it, the, her story is in my book, but it's three pages. Huh? And everything else is my imagination, you know, because yeah. I, I needed to tell that little piece. And, and I had my grandfather once tell me just one sentence that like became a book. Um, my third book happened because I had a wart and my brother <laughs> said, some, my brother said something to me and it was like, what? And so I Googled it. And the next thing, you know, I was in, the Appalachian mountains in the 1890s. I mean, it was crazy how those kinds of things just like out of nowhere, you're th you start yeah. thinking. And, and sometimes they're from so long ago, like right. To Kill a Night, which is my first novel and a mystery. Um, it's set on the U S Mexico border where I lived and uh, for decades. But when I was there, I was in the Juarez El Paso region, and there were a lot of like disappearances of, of women in Juarez. I that's been in the back of my head for decades, and it's not the only thing about this novel, but it is kind of the setup is that she has to find this missing woman, right? Right, and so it touches on all of that, and it's just that's just something that's you know, nothing recently triggered it or before I wrote the book triggered it, it's just one of those things. And then I, you know, knew I wanted to write this really kind of badass character. And so it was a good fit and it all just came together somehow. I know. I know. Well, the, the thing my grandfather told me, he told it to me when I was 15 and I didn't write that book until I was 58. Wow. <laughs> you know, and, and I did, it's not like I thought about it every day right. for all those years. Like it maybe came to the forefront oh, once or twice a year might hit me. And I wasn't ever planning to be an author. So I didn't think I was going to do anything with it. It was just a very interesting, very interesting concept. And it was just, wow. And then when I decided to write, it was like, bam, that came out again. And I thought, oh, I could do something with that. Isn't that great? And, th and then, and then a, a story is born, mm -hmm. you know? So yeah, I, I love that ability. So did you have to do a lot of research in order to write this book or did you just, because it's a made up country, you just kind of went with it? So that's the great thing is it's contemporary and it is a made up country. I mean, it's based on some real places. Yeah. And so I did some research, like even the castle is this castle that I found online. And, um, but I don't do like the kind of research that people who write historical fiction have to do at right. all. I just, once I have to do enough to know it in my head. Right. 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 To know well, and to make area. it feel believable. Right. It ha To me, it's a real place. I know exactly what it looks like, just like I right. would know at any place I have visited, but it has well, to and, be and somehow. When you did the, when you did the research for the castle mm -hmm. and now I know your castle because I've read your book. And so you had to do enough research that 
the castle didn't feel like a Disney princess castle because mm -hmm. what other castles do most of us know, right? And so you wanted to do enough research that that kind of thing, or this book takes place in a couple of different locations. We start in Italy, we mm -hmm. go to your made up country, then we're back in the United States, right? Yes. And aren't we on the border of yes, Mexico and the US, Paso. right? Right. So we're back. So you have to have at least some understanding of those areas. And if you don't know them personally to then be able to do a little research to know, for instance, that if you're going to put her in a community, you definitely would want to put her in a community where she could hide. Where would that be? Exactly. Exactly. And so, yeah, the country I made up is totally made up and it's solid in my mind. But other than that, I really don't write about places that I haven't at least been to. Okay. One of my women's fiction novels is called Five Tries to Get It Right. They go to five different countries but I've been to all of them. I all couldn't them. have right. written about a place I hadn't been to because it, it would just feel inauthentic to me. Right. So. Which is really crazy because I, I have written about countries I haven't been to. Uh -huh. um, my Sunflowers Beneath the Snow is written about Ukraine and I can't possibly go there. And what's crazy is, is that book was written and came out four weeks before the current Ukrainian crisis. Wow. So That's it amazing. was just like... Whoa, how did that happen? But I've not had the opportunity to be there. So I right. have had to rely completely on research and, and what does it feel like and, you know, photographs and, you know, film that you can watch and see yeah. people walking through the hills and knowing what you're getting, you know, what you're getting into. So, yeah, there's there's a little of that um, yeah, absolutely. For, for me, for me. But you like to write about where you've been. I do just because, and I love to travel, so right. that also helps that yeah. I, you know, go a lot of places. But there's there the, to be able, and you, you, all of a book comes from your imagination, right. right? But there's certain feels that certain places have, and I yes. love to try and get that, you know, onto the page. Right, right. You know? I I love that. So, what is next for you? I, you've got a lineup. You told me you had a lineup. So, what yeah, are you yeah. working on? So the next book that comes out is the sequel to my mystery. So it's okay. the second in that series. And I'm already writing the third in that series. But then um, I have this other idea that I think I do NaNoWriMo every year. So yeah, yeah. I love NaNoWriMo when you write a book in, or, well, you write in a, a month. Dozen words yeah. in November. And so that one's going to be another women's fiction. It's going to be very different than, than my other ones. So, okay. Um, so I love meeting a cross genre author like myself because I've got, although I have three historical fiction, I have trouble really labeling them as such because one is starts in 1970 and to call that <laughs> historical just hurts my soul. Um, and then I have a world war two, which is very mm -hmm. much, but then I have one in 1890s in the North Carolina mountains, <laughs> which is also historical, but it's not like they, any of them attach to one another. You know, it's not like right. I'm a, I'm not a World War II genre. Yes. And then just to, to throw things, you know, into disarray, I've written a children's book that I hope will be out by Christmas. And I am currently writing a contemporary humor women's fiction oh, story fine. about a woman going through menopause. <laughs> and yes, and everybody does that when I say it. So I know it's going gonna, it's gonna to do well. But and I've been worried. Because it's like, am I committing author suicide by by like jumping ship and, and changing genre? But then I, I go back to, I am a character-driven fiction author. And right. I go where my characters tell me they need to be to make this story work. I, I totally agree. Look, yeah. if I wrote in one genre and if I just wrote a series, I would sell more books. But I have got to write the stories that are in my heart. Yeah. yeah. You know. I don't want to be bored. I get bored very easily and I don't want to be bored. I don't want to, I don't want to hate what I'm doing. I very much want to like, I don't know. I so have, I hated it. No. So <laughs> have you considered writing in different genres than, than the ones that you've touched on? Have you considered historical fiction or. Um, so I probably wouldn't do, and this is terrible, especially. No, no. I no, 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 no. I just want to do the research. Yeah. Well, you know, and so much research to do historical fiction. And I just, you know, 
I have toyed with writing a middle grade series about the environment with my son. Um, oh, that would be interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So lots of different ideas out there. Who, how would someone get up with you, Catherine, if they said, I want to know more about these books mm -hmm. or I want to know more about Catherine's writing process or whatever? How do they get up with you? So you can reach me at katherinedodson.com. Super oh, easy. Super easy. Links will be in the show notes below. <laughs> yeah. And I've got, you know, I've got all the books there. I have ways to get in contact with me. I do a weekly newsletter out to everyone. Fantastic. Um, and then it also links to um, my book coach site. So if you're an author, we've got all kinds of fun things like YouTube. Oh, wonderful. Stuff like that. Wonderful. Wonderful. All right. So yeah. if you want to keep this book discussion going, I want you to head on over to Novels and Latte Club on Book Club on Facebook. And as a member of that group, you're going to have the opportunity to win Catherine's book. She'll mm -hmm. uh, provide you with a digital copy of Portrait of Deception. And trust me, guys, you want to read this book. It was really good. Like I said, had me on the edge of my seat. Um, so definitely head on over there and the links will be in the show notes. Um, Catherine, I want to thank you so much for being with me today. This has been a fabulous discussion. Oh, it's been so much fun. Thank you. Yes. And so have a great one. And folks, run out, grab the book. Make sure you do a review. Everybody loves a good review. All right. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Online for Authors, where I, Terry M. Brown, author of character-driven fiction and host of the podcast, introduce readers to characters they'd love to invite to lunch. Tune in next Tuesday for another podcast episode.